Welcome to Towards a Smarter World. This is Cruz Saunders, your host, and I'm here today with Jim Edmonds, founder and CEO and president of Ingenix Corporation, a leading provider of digital content management software. Ingenix is used by organizations around the world to create and manage websites, communities, and enterprise knowledge. The company was founded in 2000 to create innovative tools for managing and delivering content for an emerging digital marketplace. Jim's been all around and seen everything in the industry with a background in technology, publishing, entertainment. He's worked at Electronic Arts and Microsoft. And when he's not talking about content management, Jim is a wonderful wine connoisseur and host of amazing dinners. You can ask him about his CMS Meritage, the Cabernet Merlot Syrah combination. So Jim, it's a pleasure to get to speak with you uh, in in podcast form here. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Chris. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So we we both just returned from LavaCon, the annual content community conference that's held each fall, and it's always such a great source of inspiration. I'm curious, what were some of the biggest uh, takeaways for you? Well, you know, I think come away from each LavaCon just um, amazed at how much passion and energy that group of attendees has for the work they do and the digital content content space generally. You know, I think two big takeaways for me uh, this year. Uh, one, and it sounds a little bit uh, strange coming from the CEO of a, of a CMS company, but the quality of the authoring experience really matters. And I say that because our industry, the CMS industry, really has put a lot of focus in the last few years on all of the kinds of bells and whistles around the mechanics of delivering content. You know, and this is broadly known as digital marketing features. But what you realize when you talk to this group of people is that they're working in digital authoring tools for 80% of their professional working hours. And that quality of that experience, the depth of the features, the ability for them to address their needs is very critical. And I think we as an industry, and certainly in Genius as a company, we're really focused on how we can extend the depth of those features and improve that overall authoring experience. That makes sense. I mean, we've we've, uh, been noting just the, the number of enterprises that are dependent upon Microsoft Word as the primary authoring environment. And a big part of that comes down to the ease of use and transportability of the format. And as that content moves from Word into a CMS, usually there's a, a manual transformation and that ends up creating sort of a friction point. Content also gets lost in translation often. So anything we can do to improve that authoring experience really makes a difference for content integrity as a whole in in an enterprise environment that's very busy. Yeah, I agree completely. And it's a, you know, it's a good segue to uh, my second tech takeaway, which is um, the increasing value of the semantic layer in enterprise content in order for that content to have value in order for that content to be portable there needs to be a very rich metadata layer to how that content is categorized for its use throughout the enterprise content lifecycle. And where in the past, this conference has been very focused um, around an audience who are uh, technical content authors and managers. This year and a little bit last year, you're seeing a whole new group of people attend this conference. They're the marketing managers and the sales managers who realize that this technical content is essential to their job of uh, the deep content well in accessing new audiences, new customers, and fulfilling those engagement needs throughout the life cycle of that customer engagement process. Love it. Yeah. And, and in your experience, as you look across the uh, enterprise, what are you seeing as some of the biggest challenges these different authoring groups are facing when it comes to organizing effective content strategy, especially in a, in a, in a unified way. Yeah. Uncertainty, I think is a huge challenge. Uh, It's the old uh, concept of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So a lot of um, organizations and individuals who are responsible for 
um, technical content or content strategy within those organizations are really uncertain about where to start and where to go. And as you know, in uh, my keynote address at the conference, I told a story about maps. And any journey, you have to start with a map. That map may be wrong, it may be right, but it gets you focused from how you get from where you are now to how you get to where you want to go. And once you get to where you want to go, you may find out you're not actually in the place you thought you were, but at least you have a baseline reference of what you were setting out to do, and you can compare your results against that baseline reference. So getting past that uncertainty and having a map that points you in the direction and being able to refer back to that. I think another challenge, and again, maybe weird for a, a software company executive to say, but I think there's an over-reliance on technology. Um, there's a sense that technology is gonna solve the problem. And there's, there's almost sort of a application feeding frenzy right now in the enterprise. We can buy this application, this application, this application, they're gonna solve our problems. But at the end of the day, content is created by humans and you have to invest in human capital. You have to invest in the systems and processes that allow those humans to create content and manage it effectively. So it's not, um, the technology isn't gonna solve the problem. The technology is just the tool. And then, um, not necessarily a challenge, but I think a mindset is you have to be willing to iterate because chances are that map you draw is not gonna be completely correct. And so you have to start out the process knowing that after you're finished, you're probably going to start again. And that's the, through that iteration that you get it right. Got it. And what do you think the Ingenix content strategy around unified content portals does to kind of help fix some of those challenges in the organization? What, what is a unified content portal? Why should enterprise owners consider one? Yeah, great question. So just to, to answer the question, what is a unified content portal? It's a way of providing unified access to information for a particular audience. So in today's digital content world, most organizations are experiencing both a proliferation of content because there's so many, there's so much content that needs to be created in so many different formats for so many different audiences. And at the same time, a fragmentation and segmentation of that content. So that content is getting siloed in multiple places. Simply put, a unified content portal bridges those silos. And so, um, you know, kind of getting back to this over-reliance on technology and this proliferation of applications, a unified content portal is a way of basically saying, look, you have this huge investment already in content creation processes and content applications. Those may or may not be a good way to solve the problem, but they're what you have now. And a unified content portal basically provides a way to bridge those silos, bring that information together, and allow the audience to engage with it in the way the organization um, needs to manage that engagement. So it's not necessarily a single source of content, and it's definitely not a place where all audiences are managed. Uh, for instance, you wouldn't necessarily want to manage information for your internal employees in the same portal that you manage information engagement for your customers. Unified Content Portal is typically very audience specific, but it gathers together all of the information and business processes for that particular audience. Got it. Is single source reasonable goal for organizations? I, I, I hear that term and it always baffles me a little bit. It's as though knowledge exists in one place. And... <laughs> yeah, it's an admirable goal, probably not reasonable. Uh, just given the mechanics of the way content is created and, and managed and delivered. You know, at the baseline, uh, what a unified content portal is doing is it's authenticating users, identifying who they are, um, managing their access to and uh, permissioning of content for them, and then really applying uh, sort of the workflow processes and business rules of how you want to engage 
with that particular audience member and that audience in general, and then delivering that across a multitude of platforms, targets, websites, what have you. It would be great if you could do that from a single source, but the the time investment and um, level of effort investment in doing that is prohibitive for a lot of organizations. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, the movement we've been working towards with clients today is this uh, multi-source or omni-source kind of mindset where we look at needing to reconcile um, uh, many sources into many destination points. And so the, 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 the content technology stack becomes a intermediary helping to facilitate the movement of, of that content into the customer experience endpoints and our employee uh, discovery endpoints that are, are necessary to, to make that, that knowledge, that, that content in its various forms uh, in, useful and employable for, for work um, by machines and by humans. And so it's that intervening connective tissue where content technology helps to, to connect those, those source points with those destination points. Does that kind of resonate for you as well? Yeah, definitely. Do you find that organizations tend to look at their content on the basis of uh, the methodology or the application with which it's created rather than um, looking at the content for its sort of fundamental or underlying value? For sure. I th I th this is maybe the, one of the biggest mm -hmm. mental transitions that organizations uh, need to embrace as they work towards a new content operating model is this general notion that content needs to be elevated in importance above tooling and above process. Process and tooling need to support the, the content itself, but the content with its structure and its semantics is its own endeavor. And that the tooling and the infrastructure and the process around that content needs to ultimately serve its durability and transportability and value to the consumers, the producers and consumers of the content itself. Yeah, once you you know, once you can make that conceptual shift, um, then you sort of opened up the discussion to, okay, how do I start looking at this content in a way where uh, it's, I have a much more flexible, much more agile strategy for how to create it and how to deliver it. And you get, you sort of break down those contextual barriers of this lives here and I have to work with it here, or this lives there and I have to follow this process in order to get it there. Yeah. Adaptive structure to the content or adaptive nature of the content is something that enables organizational resilience and also customer experience flexibility. When we're focused on tooling, we get kind of mired or anchored into creating experiences that are tied or constrained by the tooling or by the, the process. But when we focus on sort of building an adaptable, nimble brain out of which customer experiences come, then that gives us that flexibility that, that you're, you're speaking of for orchestrating lots of customer experiences across lots of endpoints um, with content coming in from multiple contributors. It just requires some level of standardization and, and process normalization in the middle to make that possible because um, without standardization, we end up with a mess. And so this you know, vision around the unified content portal is, is interesting because it, it starts to look at how do we work our way out of that mess and into coherence within the, the content sets and the way they're delivered. Yeah, for us, I don't know if you're seeing this, but for us, the, the tip of that spear is the marketing and sales and fulfillment departments. They're not, you know, they're not familiar with the technical landscape and the technical challenges and Frankly, they don't really care. They just know that there's this content there that has value and they want to get their hands on it. It has to move upstream into the enterprise uh, for people who deal with this on a daily basis to figure out, okay, how are we going to enable this content? But they've they've identified the value in that and they're changing, they're changing the discussion about how that content is accessed and used. And that's really what drives what we see driving the um, unified content portal market. You know, 
the CMO has been the ultimate sponsor of most of the content intelligence initiatives that A has enacted over the last year. We have found uh, marketing teams have some of the biggest driving underlying need for availing themselves of structured content and of you know intelligent and nimble process uh, improvements across a new operating model for content. And that the CIO and CTO are more than willing to participate when they realize the streamlining that that offers uh, the IT functions within the organization. But we would absolutely agree that the folks dealing with customer experience in the top line revenue driving functions of the organization are the ones really feeling the most pressing need for change now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, we've talked in the past about various kinds of stacks that enable a more nimble future for, for content. And, and you've done a talk about futurizing a digital content stack and and I'm curious ab about your perspective on, on how organizational leaders can stay ahead of all of the evolving changes across digital marketing in particular, but the landscape in general. Well, a familiar refrain from us, I know you, you heard me talk about it ad nauseum, but you know, I think it starts with structure structuring your content and that means obviously you know getting it out of emails and getting it out of word documents but it also means being able to add the semantic layer uh, the metadata the categorization uh, the reference the schema structure that uh, allows you in essence to atomize that content because you have to stop looking at the way content is being created and you have to start looking at the way content is being consumed so what really impacts um, the future use of your content and what really drives making sure your content is future proof is getting it out of the constraints of the way constraints of the way it's created, whether that's a particular application or whether that's just the lack of semantic value resident in in the content and looking at how you can add semantic value um, at the metadata layer. So you can basically keep that content portable, whether that's multi-channel delivery, whether that's multi-device, multi-format delivery, or whether it's eventually moving it into um, new technologies. You won't get it right, I don't think, the first time, but you know it's an iterative process and you've got to start that effort to start adding value in the form of structure to your content. Related to that, and maybe directly, is uh, content as a service, as as an endpoint, what is content as a service um, and, and why should content owners be thinking about content APIs? Content as a service is really about the delivery of content rather than necessarily the creation of content. It sort of stands the notion, the traditional notion of a CMS on its head. Um, and in traditional notice of a, no, notion of a content management system, content is created in and deployed from a single system or application environment. Content as a service takes the content creation process with the notion that it's going to be delivered to other application environments and other content repositories and other delivery mechanisms. So it's really about being able to take the structure of that content and make it very portable in the way it's delivered. And I think it recognizes um, just the current maturation life cycle phase that we're in right now. We've spent the last 25 years building digital infrastructure and organizations have a huge investment in that digital infrastructure. They've invested millions of dollars, thousands of hours in creating applications, creating websites, creating digital delivery mechanisms. And those span a range of technologies and a range of formats. So I think the, you know, the next big value add for content management systems is to be able to deliver into that infrastructure without requiring organizations to rip them out and replace them or to retool them. And I think that's a huge value add for organizations as they look at their investment and how they're going to get the content agility needed to move content and address opportunities in that existing infrastructure investment. Love it. And I'd love to 
bridge now to the Ingenix platform, I'm curious about your vision for how Ingenix fits into that service-oriented architecture approach. Where does Ingenix fit within the whole landscape of content technology? We made some very fortuitous decisions when we first founded the company and defined our architecture. So, you know, at a baseline level, content in our system is structured. It's structured at the schema level. It's structured at the metadata level. So we paid a price at that, I think, at the outset in that maybe the initial the initial investment curve in using that system was a little more demanding than other systems. But I think that that has really paid off for us in that any content that is in the engineering CMS is inherently structured, inherently portable, and that lends itself to the current landscape that we're, we're dealing with in content management and content delivery. Another really fortuitous architectural decision we made was to have a decoupled CMS. So we separate the, the content layer from the presentation layer, and that's done at both architectural level as well as just a physical server level. So what that means is you create content and in one environment and you deploy it from another environment. And so just by nature of having that decoupled, we automatically support content as a service because we're already in an architectural situation where content's being man managed from a structured perspective. It can be atomized and it can be delivered to not just our content management delivery environment, but any content delivery environment. So I think we're somewhat unique in the marketplace because of that. And I think we're really well positioned for what I see as kind of the next wave, what, what David Hillis in our organization calls the third wave of content management. We're very well positioned, I think, for that. Wonderful. What, what's next for the platform? Well, we're definitely focused on how we can continue to improve um, the authoring experience for our users, how we can add more depth of features there. It's very important, I think, to recognize the way digital content working processes are changing. You know, I think in the first phase of digital content management, we're really focused on disintermediation. You know, how can we reduce costs for content delivery? I think the next wave of the content management uh, environment is gonna be content creation. How can we improve the content creation process and how can we cut costs in the content creation process? And we're going to do that by, as you pointed out in your keynote, Cruz, we have to reduce this incredible human investment in copying and pasting and creating for multiple environments and multiple targets. So it's always a pleasure to hear you talk about those kinds of things because it resonates very well with our product roadmap. I think the other thing we're focused on is really looking at our entire architecture and how that becomes more modular. So we can take any aspect of our architecture, content planning and governance, content creation, content workflow, content delivery, and we can apply it to any particular problem, whether that problem is behind the firewall or that problem is in front of the firewall. And so just making our overall platform more agile and more modular. I think those are the two big directions we see uh, in the near future. Thank you. I'm uh, inspired by the XML and faceted content uh, architectural approach of the platform. And it's something that um, we're very glad to see evolving towards that same level of commitment to providing infinite endpoints through content APIs and through increasing connections to a semantic layer, both on platform and expressed externally. And I think that is in the finest traditions of sort of the product management approaches in the industry. So thanks for including us in your ecosystem. As a last question, I'd love to talk a little bit about wine for those in the <laughs> listening audience that may uh, share share your passion for wine. Uh, some people may not know is that as a, as a winemaker yourself, you've been developing um, wines for many, many years. And I'm curious what makes an enjoyable wine and, and are there uh, any parallels between content and wine? Well, I'm a, I'm a home hobbyist, so um, I'm very familiar with 
with failure and embracing my failures as a winemaker. There's an old saying, you know, winemaking is 80% materials and 20% technique. Beer making is 20% materials and 80% technique. I don't know if that's actually true because I think there actually is a lot of complexity and technique to making good wine, as I've discovered over the years. But it's an interesting metaphor, I think, for content strategy and content management. Good content strategy, good content management starts with great content. Good wines start with great grapes. And if you don't invest in the content and the human capital needed to create and manage that content, you won't have a great content strategy. And so that's, you know, that's one parallel I often make about making wine and and making great content. The other one is, comes back to, to structure. What makes a great wine is great structure. You've got a nice balance between the fruits and sugars on the one side and the acid on the other. That's what makes a wine really stand up, what makes it last, and what makes it an enjoyable experience to drink it. Um, content the same way. What makes great content, what makes that con- what gives that content life and longevity is the structure in that content. So that's another metaphor I like to like to use. Oh, I love it. I love it. And that that CMS uh, blend is, uh, is is famous throughout uh, your your user community. I know. Well, so, like, I'll, I'll try to I'll try to sneak some into Texas next time I come to visit you. But uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think they're checking at the board in Texas now for bringing in uh, any outside wines. I know, the wine country. <laughs> try, trying to keep a monopoly locally. Oh, yeah. Well, good, Jim. Thank you for your time today. Appreciate you sharing all these insights with our listeners and, and look forward to seeing you around in the industry. Thank you, Chris. I really enjoyed it. Okay, bye-bye. This episode of Towards a Smarter World is brought to you by A, the Content Intelligence Service. Learn more about intelligent customer experience powered by content strategy, engineering, and operations at simpleA.com. 